Welcome to NACTV Reads the News. My name is Christine Waddell, and I'm one of many volunteers that help create programming for our station. NACTV can be seen on MTS Channel 30 or 1030, Westman Cable Channel 117, Bell Satellite Channel 592, and online at NACTV.TV. These programs are made possible by our volunteers, staff, advertisers, as well as donations made by you, the viewers. If you are enjoying NACTV, please consider supporting us either by donation or volunteering. You can contact our office at 204-476-2639 or at NACTV at WCG w-a-v-e dot c-a that's n-a-c-t-v w-c-g wave dot c-a and this week's Nipawa banner and press is not one but two sections it's the farmers advocate this week but we'll start with the front section and it leads with the Maker's Market brings artisans to Nipawa. A tourism-led event at Riverbend Park exceeds expectations, and there's a lovely photograph of painter Robert Duterte Garcia posing with two of his buyers at the Riverbend Market on Friday, July 23rd. And there he is in the center with all his lovely paintings. And the article is by Owen Devereaux, some glorious weather over the weekend surely helped to bring in the crowds to Riverbend Makers Market in Nipawa on July 23 and 24. Of course, the fact that it was also the first large-scale event of any kind that's been permitted in the region for nearly eight months also likely contributed to its, its success. In total, 38 vendors sold their unique creations to a combination of local residents and tourists who flocked to Nipawa from across the province last weekend. The current unofficial attendance count indicates that there were 1,031 patrons that walked through the doors with 407 admissions on Friday night and 624 throughout Saturday. The final numbers for attendance could be more once the final gate receipts are tallied. And the, we continue the story on in the center with more photographs and it goes on the Maker's Market was organized by Nipawa Tourism with board member Kelsey Wilson dreaming up the concept and leading the way in its inception. Wilson said that the entire event was extremely well received. I feel that everything went according to plan in terms of setup, no major hiccups. We had every pos every very positive feedback both from the vendors and patrons. The vendors loved the location at Riverbend and the people that attended felt the market was well organized. They commented on how beautiful Riverbend Park is, the variety of vendors, and just how well organized it was, said Wilson. Wilson also noted that there, that there was seemed to be a real sense of joy both from the vendors and patrons in seeing Nipawa hosting a summer event again. The Maker's Market turned into much more than simply an opportunity for artisans from across the province to gather and put their wares on display. Nipawa Tourism decided to use the event as a fundraising opportunity for the swimming pool. It was decided that 100% of the gate admissions would be given to the pool to assist with its maintenance and upgrades. Nipawa's Economic Development Officer, Marilyn Crew, noted that while final numbers were still being tabulated, the amount brought in could be in the around, in around $4,600. She said receiving this type of support from a volunteer-led group such as Nipawa Tourism is very much appreciated. Crew was also quite thankful to all the local, local businesses that saw the value that the Maker's Market could bring to Nipawa and donated in one way or another to help out. 
Nivois Tourism had some expenses because it was our first event. We had to get signage, posters and things like that, but our sponsors were so generous. Breaker 16, for example, supported us with the fencing that surrounded the location, and that was amazing. That fencing, it made the event easier. There were so many others that supported us, and we are thankful to all of them, said Crew. It's not just about that one event, it's about the impact on the community and all the other retail and whatever else people did while they were in town. You just can't put a thousand visitors plus the vendors into the community and not see impact in other areas. While it may feel a bit too early to say this will become an annual event, Wilson had indicated that Nipawa Tourism had already received numerous requests from vendors to come back next year and have a new vendors and had new vendors requesting to come next summer. That has, has her optimistic that this could be an annual tradition. I feel that we ex exceeded our expectations on the amount of patrons and participation. If I have Nipua Tourism backing me again, I will definitely commit to another market next summer for sure. And there is a lovely photograph that Kira Patterson took of a view of the Riverbend market from the west side of the field in which it was set up in Riverbend Park just east of the Nipua pool and a picture of uh, the planter pots made by naturally imperfect concrete, one of the vendors at the market, and a bouquet of sunflower cookies at the vendor Maddie's Mom's Cookies in her display. While we're on that same page, down at the bottom there's a rather humorous photograph that was submitted by Natalie Gordon. And uh, if you pick up a copy of the paper, you'll be able to see it much, much better. But when you look at the crossroads, you see a stop sign, two stop signs facing you on so who is supposed to stop? There was some confusion in Alonza recently. Natalie Gordon of that town spotted these stop signs. What's the issue? Well, they're both facing the same way at opposite sides of the intersection. The signs have been replaced and put in the wrong way. Gordon notes that it was fixed up quickly, the very embarrassed highway crew having taken care of the issue shortly after this photo was taken but generated considerable amusement. It was the town's big excitement for the week. So appreciate the submission from Alonza. And if we go back to page two, oh, there is a story on the bottom I'll read first because it doesn't continue. Kira Patterson wrote, second annual dream ride eclipses inaugural event. The second annual Dream Ride, raising money to help Westman kids' dreams come true, blew the first year's record out of the water. The event took place on Saturday, July 24th at Riding Mountain National Park and featured 30 cyclists and 13 walkers doing routes between 50 and 14 kilometers long. There has been excellent feedback from all the participants and planning discussion on a third annual Dream Ride in 2022 on how to grow and get more involved already, noted Marsha Forgue, one of the event organizers. The walking portion of the event was a last minute successful detail of the day that will continue to be incorporated. The participants raised money in the months leading up to the ride with a goal of beating last year's total of about $22,000. The total this year smashed last year's, creating a new record of $42,506 as of Tuesday, July 27th. For the event to almost double this year was astonishing, expressed for you. The money raised for such a meaningful cause was unbelievable. Every cyclist and walker did amazing with their pledges. Our community, as well as other communities, supported the event to bring dreams to children with terminal illnesses. We are so thankful to, for everyone. Gary and Marsha Forgue put together the fundraiser in partnership with the Dream Factory.
a Manitoba-based organization that helps make dreams come true for sick children across the province. The Dream Ride focuses on raising funds for kids in the Westman area. This year the event was raising funds for two little girls from Brandon, Bree and Aria, four-year-old and two-year-old sisters are both battling serious illnesses. Bree has a cancer called Ewing sarcoma, while Aria has a neurological disorder called metachromatic leukodystrophia, MLD. The amount raised is not only going to give Dream Ride 2021 sisters Bree and Aria their dreams, but will help the Dream Factory to make an impact on others as well, Forgue stated. Thank you to every Dream Ride, every Dream Rider, Dream Walker, sponsor, prize donator, and to everyone who donated. All of you have met the Dream Factory mission, making dreams come true for Manitoba kids battling life-threatening illnesses. The real world can be scary, but their dreams can carry them away to a place where kids are, can be just kids. And there is a photograph of the two sisters. They were able to attend the dream ride so participants could meet the two girls that they were raising money for. And there's a photograph of the riders and walkers as they were doing their different distances and people could cheer them on. And a story across the page that doesn't continue uh, is McCreary Heritage Planning Series of Events. And again, this is by Kira Patterson. Agriculture and Heritage Celebration set for Sunday, August 1st. A number of events are coming up in McCreary with the first planned for this weekend McCreary Heritage Advisory Committee in conjunction with Burroughs Trail Arts Council and the McCreary Agricultural Society have organized a Manitoba 150 Heritage and Agricultural Celebration on Sunday, August 1st at the Ag Society grounds. Pam Little, Secretary for the Heritage Committee and member of the event subcommittee explained that they've been trying to host a Manitoba 150 ever since 2019. We did have a grant from Manitoba 150 in 2019 to do a community homecoming and we had to postpone to last year and then we postponed to this year and then we've now postponed to next year because of COVID-19. Little noted, she explained that after this year the grant would be no longer available so they were able to reapply for the grant to use for different purposes. So we got money not as much as we would have had for a homecoming, but we got a really nice grant from Manitoba 150, she said, which will be used for this series of events taking place throughout August and September. The other events are still being planned, but they will include a free swim at the McCreary Pool, a reading by local author Annette Mowat, some pop-up concerts and historic hikes. The grant also allowed the Heritage Committee to get two summer students who are currently working on creating a virtual historic tour of McCreary. Little said that the committee only found out that they received the grant a couple of weeks ago, so this weekend's event was put together very quickly and more details will, will be released about the rest of the series in the weeks to come. The the August 1st event will kick off in the afternoon with Brandon Road Rebels Car Club taking a cruise through town around 2.30 p.m., then parking at the Ag Grounds at 3 p.m. for event goers to take a closer look and admire their rides. A farmer's market will also start at 3 p.m. Little noted that the market won't be huge, but the seven vendors will have a wide variety of products, from locally raised pork to McCreary maple syrup, to home-baked goods and more. The Ag Society will be running a barbecue starting at 4 p.m. with proceeds from the, that going to support their organization. At 5 p.m., the downtown, the D-Town Steppers, a Dauphin-based dance group that does traditional Métis jigging, will be performing. Then from 6.30 to 8 p.m., a twin fiddling act 
Double the Trouble will be performing a concert. At 8.30 p.m., gates open for the drive-in movie. There will be a short film about the history of a plane that crashed in Riding Mountain National Park during World War II, pilot training in 1944, after the short. The feature film will be Secret Life of Pets 2. There is an entry fee for the whole event, with the drive-in movie included. However, those who would like to come to the movie only can, only can pay a smaller fee for that. The money will go towards covering the costs of the event, and anything extra will help with the maintenance of the McCreary Museum. Pu <coughs> Public health precautions? This weekend's event will be limited in a few ways as to who and how many people can come. They will have to cap the number of people at 150, which includes vendors, performers, and volunteers. It's only open to fully vaccinated adults and then children under 12 that are accompanied by fully vaccinated person who lives in the same residence, Little stated. She explained that the committee will, didn't want to have to put that rule in place, but when they approached public health officials about what they needed to do to have the event, they were told full vaccination was required. That's what they've decided for us, she stressed. We agonized over this because at first it was, let's forget this and we don't want to be the group that's doing this. But then my committee and I so proud of, and I'm so proud of them, they got brave and they said, let's go for it. Let's start the ball rolling. The options they had were either cancel the event altogether, only allow a drive-in event where people couldn't get out of their vehicles or required attendees to be fully vaccinated. We've been doing a lot of virtual things, all of us. What we wanted was in person, walk around and enjoy the event. While it was a tough decision to make, Little noticed that she was very happy the committee decided to go ahead and do the event. So that's coming right up this Sunday, August 1st. And over on page two, Owen Devereaux made a quick trip to Minidosa on Wednesday morning. Minidosa moving ahead on regional event center build. Construction on $8 million facility expected to start in late 2021 or early 2022. And uh, Minidosa will soon be home to a brand new regional recreation facility. On Wednesday, July 28th, Mayor Pat Scatch, along with members of the Minidosa Regional Event Center, MREC, committee confirmed they are moving forward with the design and construction of a new arena. The facility will be located on the existing agricultural grounds which can be found on the northwest end of town. The total cost of the project is estimated to be the eight million dollar range. This long-awaited project is now able to proceed due to the community recently receiving 3.75 million from the federal government's Investing in Canada Infrastructure Program. That money, combined with contributions from the towns surrounding RMs and several local fundraising efforts over the years, has generated $6.9 million already. Fundraising for the remaining $1.1 million will continue over the course of the next year. MREC Committee Co-Chair John Lewis said that for the many people within the community, this announcement has been a long time coming, as this has been in the works for the last 12 years. There's an exhilaration in the crowd here today because this has been something the members of MREC committee have been working for well over a decade. And now that the announcement has been made and we know it's coming, it's just a huge lift and we're, we'll just move it up to the next step just keep working until we keep get this finished said Lewis this will be an asset to the community and it's something we've been waiting for for 12 years and now we can put it into place and the group uh, is photographed there by Owen Minidosa Mayor Pat Scatch in the front row in blue and white blue and white stands with several individuals connected to the effort to get a new recreation facility financed and built within the community. And uh, no sod turning, but they were at the site.
Lewis also acknowledged co-chair Scott Burgess and his tireless effort over the years to make this day a reality. He also said that there were countless volunteers and supporters over the years who deserved to celebrate this announcement. For Minnedosa, Mayor Pat Scatch, the announcement of the new regional center is the cumulative accumulation of a truly inspired community effort. I was reflecting on the work that had gone into making this happen and thought to myself, my God, the reality and the results of all that time, effort and dedication is here. We've been working on this project for so long, I really can't fully put into words how I'm feeling right now because I've been involved for this for the full 12 years, noted Sketch. As well, Sketch acknowledged the RMs of Minto Odana and Oakview, who have each agreed to support this project financially. She said that this is simply not a Minidosa facility, but rather one for the entire region. Serving as a multi-purpose space, this will have something for everyone. It will support future growth for Minidosa and the surrounding region, which will in turn create a more vibrant and healthy community. And it continues on the back. The next step in the process for the MREC Center will be finalizing the design in order to confirm the total costs. Mayor Sketch noted that will be taking place shortly in order to ensure construction can begin by either the end of this year or early 2022. We're in a really good position right now, but we can't say what our final figure will be until we get a contract signed and a de design picked. But Eight million is our estimate right now, and we're, we're confident that it will create an incredible recreation facility that the entire region can be proud of. As for the MREC committee, it plans on continuing to raise local funds needed for the project through donations and sponsorship. Anyone interested in supporting the project is asked to contact the town of Minidosa at minidosa at minidosa.com or 204-867-2727. And there's photographs of Mayor Sketch and the MREC committee co-chair, John Lewis, as they were speaking. I don't normally make note of advertisements, but on the back page are annual results of the fat stock show and sale there. Thank you to all the buyers with the members' names and another successful event, and again, done virtually. So let's go back, and we'll go backwards through the paper for a few minutes, and do the important page that everyone turns to immediately upon getting their paper, and that is notices. And there's In Memories, Chris Dutko, October 9th, 74 to July 20th, 2002. Dear son, while you were here, you had a special gift. Everyone you interacted with was with felt tended to, expressing yourself according, accordingly to each friend, child, stranger, and kin. That is what we loved about you and miss most. It's been 19 years, but we still think of you every day. Mom and Dad, love. And a Frederick Smith, who passed away in 2010. He is remembered by Nancy and Bob Nelson of Austin, Sheila and Curtis Chandler of California, Don Marie and Donald of Winnipeg, Karen and Robert Smith of Edrins. A more joyous note is happy anniversary, 65th wedding anniversary to Alvin and Lola Wark, August 4th, 1956 to 2021. Best wishes from your family. And one obituary, Erwin Yock. It is with deep sadness the family announces the passing of Erwin Yock on June 10, 2021 in Nipua Hospital. Erwin was born on January 29, 1940,
to David and Sophie Yock on the farm near Siemens, Saskatchewan. When he was three and a half years old, the family moved to the current farm near Riding Mountain. He attended Glen Allen School, completing grades one to 10. At 13 and a half years, his father passed away and he made a lifelong commitment to the land and a way of life, which for him including growing trees and farming. He worked very hard and enjoyed his work. It was his livelihood and his passion. Later, as times improved, he found he needed more than one tractor. Massey Ferguson, of course. He kept up with the ever-changing nature of his business. He loved his Massey Ferguson tractors, and his nieces and nephews enjoyed many tractor rides as he was hoping he could persuade them to be farmers. Irwin became part of a very tightly knit group of siblings that offered each other support under all circumstances. Irwin's extended family was a big, important part of his life. He would teach as much as about the business of farming as anyone was willing to learn. His life was highlighted by his love of fishing. His joy was taken to take his zodiac to wherever he could find water to fish and explore. His nieces, nephews, and friends will never forget the fun they had boating, fishing, and camping. Urban was a very positive social person. He liked to help where he could or simply enjoy visiting and making new friends. His mind was always open to new ideas and new ways of doing things. In his later years, he designed a new home, read books, improved his cooking skills, curled, and spent more time with his lifelong friends. Irwin was raised in the Lutheran faith. He was confirmed in Christ Lutheran Church, Waldersee. In recent years, he enjoyed worshiping at Christ Lutheran Church, Christ, Christ Lutheran Nepo, and Erickson Lutheran. Irwin was predeceased by his parents, David and Sophie Yock. He is survived by his sisters Irene, Rosalie and Bert, Margaret, husband Gary, nieces, nephews, Janice, Steve, Christopher, Jennifer, Rachel, husband Lawrence, Craig, Kelly, and great nieces and nephews. Irwin will be greatly missed by all his family and friends. A graveside service was held June 21st, 2021, followed by internment at Duval Cemetery, Duval, Saskatchewan. White's funeral home at Nipawa was in charge of arrangements. The family expresses heartfelt gratitude to all the medical personnel at the Nipawa Hospital for their amazing care and concern for the family as a whole. Thank you. And while we're on this pair of pages, we come to Carberry and North Cyprus, Langford, here and there, that is submitted by Gladwin Scott. New Carberry United Church Minister, Reverend Emma S Simone, will conduct her first service on August 1st at 10 a.m. She recently graduated from the Atlantic School of Theology in Halifax but has served three small communities in New Brunswick for five years. The Scott family had a wonderful gathering over the weekend at Kenora Lake, at Kenora on Lake of the Woods to celebrate Gladwin and Margaret's, Marguerite's 60th wedding anniversary. Family members were able to attend from Carberry, Halifax, Thunder Bay and Minneapolis. Gladwin and Marguerite enjoyed a 60th anniversary boat ride on Lake of the Woods. Cassie Creerar allowed six hits and three runs while whiffing three and walking one for the Westman Magic, 11-3 win over the Manitoba Angels on Sunday. July 18th in Brandon, the Magic swept the doubleheader with a 16-4 triumph in the second. Uh, after the U-19 Provincials at Bloomberg in Winnipeg, August 5th to 8th, Creerar will lead, head to Duville College near Buffalo to study and pitch for head coach Megan Asham of Brandon. Coach Chris Unraw's U13 Pemina Hill squad lost a doubleheader in Portage against St. James and dropped a single contest to Brandon in Glenborough. Operating a junior hockey team is an expensive challenge. 
every, even more so during a pandemic. Dauphin Kings, who played only six games this winter, had a loss of $7,885, raising their total debt to $82,000. Their largest expense was in salaries and benefits, which totaled $1,324. A successful tractor lottery prevented a bigger loss. The Carolina Hurricanes signed Strathclair's Morgan Geeky, 22, to a one-year two-way contract in a deal worth $750,000 in the NHL and $75,000 in the American Hockey League. However, Geeky was then selected by the Seattle Kraken in the expansion draft. The municipality of Harrison Park has closed its Newdale office and will concentrate their operation in Onanol. The Newdale office will now serve the public as a Can Canada Post outlet. U.S. border restrictions will re remain in place until August 21st for non-essential travelers. It was a definite surprise when our MLA resigned her Indigenous and Northern Affairs portfolio from the provincial government, July 9th. I first met Eileen Clark when she came to Carberry one cold winter's night seeking support for the Conservative nomination. Some of her characteristics were obvious. Good listeners, common sense, people person, and past experience. Eight years as Gladstone Mayor, Vice President of AMM, businesswoman at 18. After she won the Agassiz constituency by about 5,000 votes, I jokingly told her that she might be eligible for cabinet post as the Conservatives did not have many female members and her reply was, I would not want a cabinet position because I was a woman. When the first cabinet was named, she had two portfolios, Minister of Municipal Affairs and Indigenous Northern Relations Leader. That says a lot. She held the municipal affairs position for about 18 months, but the other appointment lasted from 2016 to the present. Liberal leader Dugald Lamont paid Ms. Clark a great compliment when he shared an experience he had had with her. They had been invited to an Indigenous meeting, and she not only brought greetings from the provincial government, but spent several hours answering questions from the chiefs. She will be missed in the caucus meetings. Shortly after her resignation, she rejected the appointment to the Provincial Treasury Board. And another submission by Gladwin Scott. Uh, Don Scott retires. Well, it's official. The day we've all been dreading is here. Don's retirement. Don went into carpentry fresh out of high school in 1978, starting work for Brian Keyshaw, Nishaw. He completed his apprenticeship in August of 1982 and that same summer started his own business Scott Builders. His younger brother Ian Zeke worked with him from day one with Scott Builders and Don's first official job as a business owner was residing Jimmy Elliott's house. According to Zeke his older brother got smart in 1986 when he decided to switch careers going from rags to riches and into the insurance industry making the sale of Scott Builders to his little brother official in 1987. Don bought into Holbrook and Marnock Agency and the Style Shop in Carberry on August 4, 1987 when it became Holbrook, Marnock and Scott, now known as HMS Insurance, and he became partners with Garth Holbrook and Jim Marnock. They later sold the style shop and Garth retired from the business at the end of 2004. HMS merged with Guild Insurance Brokers in 2014 when they acquired another four offices, two in Brandon, one in Wawanisa, and one in Verdon, on top of their current Carberry and Shiloh offices, and it became Guild HMS Insurance Group, still with the same local ownership, but adding some more partners. Not long after the merge, Jim retired and Kelly Marnock became Don's partner in Carberry. They have since acquired an office in Kenton and partnership with Kirby Wallace and Brent and Cindy Pringle of 
Wallace agencies out of Glenborough, Holland, Baller, Cyprus as well. Don has always been a local boy and partnering with other local owned brokerages, like-minded individuals was fitting. He has worked with a lot of loyal staff over the years, including his most recent staff, Jamie McGregor, January 2021, Chelsea McPhee, March 2022, Tori Scott, December 2018, Rena Turner, July 2015 to January 2021, Chelsea Cracknell, June 2013, Crystal Berry, 2011, Kelly Marnock, 20, 2004, Kelly Hofer, 2004, and Tracy Davidson, 1994. He has also worked alongside many, many others, including longtime HMSers, Doreen Caithness, 23 years, Tracy Saunderson, 20 years, Audrey Turner, 10 years. There have been so many other special people come and go, many good times shared with the crew over the years and lifelong friendships made. To say we are going to miss Dawn is an understatement. Dawn has been a valued member of this organization for many years, 34 to be exact, and has a lot of experience and expertise that we are going to miss, along with his calm and casual demeanor and always up for some fun attitude. His dedication to the business and his clients is second to none, always giving everyone all the time and attention they need, whether he is on a Sunday evening with his on his couch at home in the middle of the night when disaster struck or a casual afternoon coffee at the office. He loved his job and every single one of his clients and co-workers. He treated everyone like family. This retirement is extremely well deserved and sad all at the same time. We will miss him dearly. Don isn't one to keep still for long so I'm sure we'll see him out and about and up at the office for coffee from time to time. Cheers to a long happy and healthy retirement. Note the current owners of HMS are Kelly Marnock, Chelsea Nee Scott Crack, Cracknell, and Tori Scott. So that's from Carberry. And back another page. Local group receives COVID-19 relief funding from Community Futures Westman and three groups, and there's three photographs. Community Futures Westman was busy giving away money in Nipawa on Monday, July 27th. As part of their COVID-19 assistance program, three local organizations received $1,000 each from the group. Top left is Nipawa Chamber of Commerce President, Carrie McPherson, in the center accepting the donation on behalf of the chamber from Community Futures Executive Director Andrew Arxies and Community Development Analyst Wendy Peterson. Top right is Nipo Alliance Club Secretary Treasurer Jason Nadeau. On the left, receiving accepted the donation to the Lions Club from Wendy Pearson and Andrew Arxy. The money will be used to help pay for some of the club's costs this year as they were unable to do any fundraising during the pandemic. And on the left is Community Futures made a donation to the Nipawa Citizens on Patrol Program, COP, to help them cover maintenance costs for their vehicles. And there's the COP RCMP liaison, Community Futures executive. Uh, so there's one of the RCMP and Jason Nadeau is the Secretary Treasurer of COP and a longtime COPP volunteer, Leonard Pritchard. So that was appreciated funding. And skip around a little bit. And easy to read, short. Thumbs up, thumbs down. Three thumbs up this week. Thanks to the banner for providing an opportunity for sending positive messages. And thank you to Cliff and Eleanor Nicholson for taking the time to send an encouraging thumbs up about the Kelwood Arboretum Gardens. Much appreciated. 
We've had several people come to visit this week because of it. Please take a few minutes this week to thank someone in your community. There are so many valuable volunteers out there. An uplifting word of gratitude goes a long way. And that is from Kathy and Grant Lewandowski at Kelwood. Gord Hamill from Erickson writes thumbs up to Ken Waddell and the editorial staff for encouraging Leonard Paramore to continue providing thoughtful comment and making the banner a more most interesting read. And from Lillian Barcelou, Nipua, a huge bouquet to the hard-working gardeners at the thrift store. So good to share. Thank you. And I'll take time to read a letter to the editor from Fred Tate at Rosendale. And it's been titled, Dislike for the Little People. The news that our MLA, Eileen Clark, had resigned from her position as Manitoba's Minister of Indigenous and Northern Affairs came as a shock, but not as a total surprise. Premier Brian Pallister has ruled his government caucus with an iron fist. In the Premier's mind, he is the government of Manitoba. When he speaks, his caucus members are to endorse every word without question. This approach to governing has resulted in, in an unprecedented decline of popularity of his government, a decline in popularity not witnessed since the days of Manitoba Conservative Premier Sterling Lyon, 1977 to 1981. The Premier's present approach to leadership may have emerged from his early life experience imprinted upon him while attending Edwin Elementary School. The Premier has publicly described how he was bullied at, in elementary school due to him being the tallest student in the class. This disclosure would indicate that the collective actions of his smaller classmates often denied him the opportunity to proceed in the direction he desired, resulting in a pathological dislike for those he sees as little people. He sees little people managing school divisions and he takes the power away from them and, from them and places Manitoba's education system under his personal control. He sees little cattle producers with long-term tenure and exclusive access to Manitoba's agricultural lands. He ends the point-based system for allocation, doubles the rent, and needlessly exposes them to uncertainties of the marketplace. Little people over past decades built and owned Manitoba Hydro, an electric utility with either the lowest or second lowest electrical utility rates in North America. He hires Brad Wall, former prime Premier of Saskatchewan, to attack the little people's utility with instructions to ignore a $5 billion power sale to Sask Power. He places the Public Utilities Board, he displaces the Public Utilities Board and empowers himself to set consumer electricity rates. The little people owned a fiber optic system attached to their electric utility. He takes it away and gives it to his friends. He is the employer of Manitoba nurses and refuses to negotiate an employment contract with them. He amends the province's Labour Legislation Act to disempower the little people who make up Manitoba's labour force, privatize a public beach, forcing little people to pay access fees to what has formerly been public land. Ideologically, I am not a conservative. However, I can say with total honesty, based upon personal contact, that Eileen Clark is by far the best MLA that this constituency has ever elected. Her resignation from the cabinet on July 9th is a significant loss to all of Manitoba. This point became obvious as, she, as her appointment replacement stumbled on his first public appearance. Eileen Clark has always been and always will be a little people in a very big way. If only she were our premier in this time of need. Fred Tate, Rosendale, Manitoba. On a more uplifting note, I'll read Rita Friesen's column, Homebodies, A Very Good Day. In the course of the conversation with my sisters, I re I realized anew that we have different interests and strengths very different. 
One of us is creative with quilting, crocheting, knitting, sewing, gardening, food prep, just to name a few. That is not me. Another is a gourmet cook, author, scholar, excels at creating a warm, inviting home, researcher and world traveler. Also, not me. I eat and cook to live and keep others alive. My garden brings me pleasure and food, simply practical. I feel more at ease with a chainsaw in my hand than with a spatula. We are all three gifted orators, some being more comfortable with an audience, but all well read and articulate. So where am I going with this? In sharing with my sisters my day's activities, I concluded with the statement, it was a very good day. What made it a very good day? I started with an early morning walk with my dog. Miss Daisy had not enjoyed as many excursions lately and was a willing partner. We had been working on and in the kitchen, not with food. The wallpaper had been removed, the cracks and crevices filled, the undercoat applied, and this day I got to paint. I did feel out of shape as I twisted and stretched to paint the areas above the cabinet and then below the cabinet. Moving the fridge and stove was easy, slow but easy, and having been satisfied with the finished results of the kitchen and dining room painting, I tackled the front door. It is a steel door, and Henry Hoover, in signaling his need to go out and to come in, had scratched the door down to the metal in more than one place on both sides. Having prepped it the day I undercoated the kitchen, made it a natural progression to finish the work. And then the people door to the garage looked like it could do with some loving. So breakfast is a given, cold cereal with fruit, and lunch was leftovers. Two easy meals, and supper consisted of frozen real meals from a caring family member. So the day's intake was as easy as I could ever dream of. That gave me more free time, well, idle time. So we headed out to the acreage at Riding and spent hours watering the gardens, deadheading the flowers, setting up sprinklers, and simply enjoying the wonder of working outdoors. The evening highlights, the Monday evening highlight, was, is, the face time with my sisters. It was after recounting this day that I could, could, could proclaim it was a very good day. The challenge then is for them to determine what would make a day a very good day for them. Sister the younger did not need time to think. Working in the yard, then spending a bit of time with her creative hobbies, then coming up with something tasty for supper. And I wonder, what does tasty have to do with eating? Sister the elder will answer next week, and I am certain it will contain a visit to the theatre or a museum, reading and time with friends. Wishing you all a very good day. And I'm going to save that if I have time at the end. I should have time at the end. Let's see. Helen's kitchen this week is raspberries. Freshly picked raspberries taste so much better than the store-bought ones. They will take your taste buds on an amazing journey. When you are picking raspberries, if you have to tug at the berry, it's not ready to be picked. Ripe raspberries, when slightly pulled, will fall into your hand without effort. They do not continue to ripen after they are picked, so pick with care. A refreshing treat for the big or little kids in your life and she's got a recipe for raspberry popsicles and raspberry crumble bars uh, Spruce Plains RCMP report during the week of July 19th to 20 July 25 Spruce Plains RCMP dealt with 61 police activities 19th, RCMP received a report of a vehicle being taken without the owner's consent in Minnedosa. Shortly after, the complainant advised that the vehicle had been returned and they did not wish to further any further action from the police. Police responded to a 9, 
911 hang-up call in Nipua that was determined to have been caused by a faulty phone line. 20th, RCMP responded to the reports of suspicious persons and vehicles in Gladstone and Nipua. Police attended and patrolled the areas, but the persons and vehicle could not be located. Police received a report of mischief in Glenella. The investigation is ongoing. Police received a well-being request at a business in Nipua. Police attended and found all was well with no cause for concern. 21st, RCMP were dispatched to an accident in Minnedosa where a motor vehicle and rail maintenance vehicle collided. The vehicles sustained damage, however, there was no injuries. Police responded to a break and enter to a cabin in Minnedosa. The matter is still under investigation. 22nd, RCMP responded to a 9-11 hang-up call in Rapid City, attended the residence and determined that a domestic assault had taken place. One person was arrested and charged as a result. Police received a report of an ongoing neighbour dispute in the RM of North Spy Cyprus, Langford. The matter is still under investigation. 23rd, RCMP responded to two commercial alarms, one in Nipoa, one in the RM of Oakview. Both were determined to be false. Police received a report of mischief in Nipoa where a vehicle, a vehicle was vandalised. The investigation is ongoing. July 24, RCMP conducted a COVID compliance check at a residence in Nipawa. All persons were found complying with quarantine regulations. Police responded to two false business alarms in Minnedosa, assisted with a sudden death in the municipality of Westburn, Westlake, Gladstone, and conducted a well-being check on a person in Nipawa. The 25th, RCMP conducted a traffic stop in Minnedosa after a vehicle was observed to be speeding, the driver was administered an alcohol screening device, which they failed. The driver was issued an immediate roadside suspension, a serious offense notice, and a speeding ticket. Police responded to a single vehicle collision in the RM of Minotona, Minto Odana, where the driver lost control on loose gravel. There were no signs of impairment and no injuries. RCMP, RCMP conducted 20 traffic enforcement actions during this report period. And on the right hand side of the page, area local reports personal close call with train. And Casper Wareham, they wrote this one up. And the photograph is of Rob Smith standing by his badly damaged old automobile friend. The truck got wrecked by a train when it stalled due to hot weather on train tracks near Austin on, uh, on July 23rd and the photo was taken by James Zacharias, Austin Deputy Fire Chief. It reads, the Banner and Press received an incident report from a reader recently. Rob Smith of Edrins, who submitted the report, had left the Manitoba Agricultural Museum on Friday, July 23rd in his truck around 3.30 p.m. Smith's brother-in-law had spent the previous two weeks demolishing and rebuilding the west front wall of the harness repair building there. With Smith's grain truck, a blue short wheelbase truck with a 12-foot metal industries box hauling the rotten boards and wood scraps on the date of the incident. He was taking some back roads home to avoid gravel and the truck not starting well on hot days. Smith noted that the vehicle slowed to a crawling speed as he crossed the CN main line two miles east of Firdale. The truck stalled on the north tracks. Smith noticing a train in the distance traveling east and downhill he began attempting to move the grain truck by putting it into second gear and cranking the starter, but was unsuccessful due to insufficient power in the battery. Then Smith tried to pry the hind wheels to get the vehicle to roll, but the tracks were too high. So raising the hood to signal of the truck to signal motor failure, Smith instead began to unload 
valuable items from the inside of the cab of the truck. Then, from a safe distance, watched as the train struck the box of the grain truck and launched it into the air. Smith told the Banner and Press that tr the truck gave a quarter turn and landed upside down on the north side of the double tracks. All traffic was diverted to the south tracks and by 9.30 p.m. the mess was all cleaned up with the train continuing east to Winnipeg with a new crew. Smith had owned the grain truck since purchasing it from the Sinclair resident in 1980. No one was hurt in the accident. And Kelwood volunteer firefighters to host a barbecue fundraiser. And Casper Warren again wrote this one. Current health restrictions will allow people to gather for a good cause. On Saturday, August 7, the Kelwood Volunteer Fire Department is hosting a fundraiser barbecue. The barbecue will run from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. and provide each individual with a burger, side, and drink with the cost of it all by donation. Volunteer firefighter Paul French noted that the funds raised will assist with the purchase of equipment and to finish off the fire hall. We built it originally 15 years ago and we've been working on it. It's just finishing off, we're just finishing off the bathroom side of it. We'd like to put a door on it now and stuff like that, said Paul. And we wouldn't mind getting a washing machine and tumble dryer so we can wash our gear as well. Small tools, equipment, anything that can be, can help us and help the public when we are called out, basically. Earl Burton, fire chief, added, the RM buys most of our big equipment, but this is a good way to pitch in, speed things up, and get it finished. This is our first fundraiser barbecue in my 30 years on the force. In addition to the food, there will be a 50-50 draw and prizes. At the time of the interviews, the prizes were still being collected from a variety of businesses. During the prize collection and canvassing, completed so far, the police, the fire department has met with a positive response. We have really good support from the community, said Paul. It's nice to be, to have them come out. We've cleaned up the fire hall and we have the fire truck out so they can have a look around as well. It's a fire crew event, but it's also been a long time since anybody's been able to gather and do anything community focused. So we're hoping people will just come out and enjoy being part of the community of Kelwood, added volunteer firefighter Lorna French. Kelwood's Fire Hall, located at 13 Stewart Avenue in Kelwood, is situated on the edge of a community made and maintained park. As such, the department told the Banner and Press that tables will be set up there and spaced out to allow for proper social distancing. People can come into the hall, look at what we've done in there, because half of the building is new at this point and then we'll get them set up with their burger drink and chips and send them off to enjoy it in their household groups said Lorna we're hoping for a good turnout because we can currently have a maximum of 150 if rules don't change anyone who attended attends the event will be required to adhere to any public health guidelines that are in place at the time of the event there are no additional rules put in place by the Kelwood Fire Department at this time. Volunteer fire staff will have masks and gloves while preparing and serving food. Everyone doing their part during these times is a blessing, and being able to fundraise is amazing, Burton enthused. We look forward to it, and we appreciate all the support we can get. The Kelwood Fire Department serves not only Kelwood, but Riding Mountain as well, Lorna told the Banner and Press. That there are currently two women on the force with most of the volunteers being quite young as well. The average age of the volunteers is estimated to be around the mid-twenties at present, with some being just un over, under or over 25, and a couple of gentlemen with more firefighting experience being around 50. It's nice to see there's young members who want to be involved in volunteer programs like this, Lorna expressed. And a note on the 
bottom of page A6 is Nipawa Memorial Monument. The plot is thickening regarding the Nipawa War Memorial Monument. The monument was featured last week, having believed to be in place for just over 100 years due to entries from the Nipawa Press 1921 archives. New information has been found which reveals that despite the Nipawa Press entry from July 1921, the monument was not unveiled until July 13, 1922. So that begs the question, has it been 100 years or 99 since it was installed? Further research is being conducted into the matter. If a applicable, another update will be printed in the future. Pops of Colour at Lily Days 2021. And again, Casper Warren was on site. They took pictures of Lily Days as they hosted, as hosted at the Lily Nook and brought plenty of colour to the Nipawa area last week. These photos depict a few of the vibrant submissions entered in the events Judge Lily show on Saturday, July 24th. And there's three gorgeous lilies stems that were the placed third and first and first depending on their category. Uh, Hugh Skinner was a winner from Roblin. And I, the other owners weren't named. And on the same page, the annual general meeting this year is going to be a lot different, Owen Devereaux reports. The Nipawa Titans Junior A Hockey Club has set the date for its annual general meeting, AGM. The event will take place Wednesday, August 4th, at 7.30 p.m. in the back room of the Nipawa Library. The AGM is open to general public, although the capacity is limited due to ongoing COVID-19 gathering restrictions. 25 is the number, I believe. Nipawa Titans Board President Ken Waddell said the, this year's AGM will cover a wide range of topics, including current financial outlook for the franchise, Waddell noted that this year's discussion will be a bit different from previous years due to a few significant factors. The AGM this year is going to be a lot different, most obviously a different name, Nipua Titans. The second thing is we can have a little more normal. We can have up to 25 people there at the library and without speaking out of turn because we haven't seen the final financial statements just yet but it's going to be a very different year in terms of, spend, of the spending, stated Waddell. From a financial point of view, it is going to be interesting. Whether or not the year that was is interesting in a good or bad way remains to be seen. Some MJHL clubs, such as Swan Valley Stampeders, who held their AGM in June, posted a net profit of $178,702. Others, such as the Dauphin Kings, confirmed a loss for the pandemic year of 7,885. Over the course of the past year, the Titans were able to cover their finances through a combination of one-time support due to the COVID pandemic and from the understanding of many sponsors who simply decided to continue to support the club despite the stoppage of the regular season and its eventual cancellation. Waddell said the pause and or outright removal of some types of expenses will also be a huge factor in the final numbers. We were able to keep our staff, but we didn't have to pay referees, we didn't have to pay travel expenditures, billet fees for the year, we didn't have to pay for a lot of stuff. It will be interesting to view these financial statements compared to other years. Odell expressed his gratitude to all the business owners who have supported the club and in essence said this past year, you did the best you can under the circumstances. Carry on, we'll be with you again next year. Other items to be discussed will likely include recent player commitments, 
planned fundraising events and upgrades to the Titans dressing room at the Yellowhead Center. Waddell said he's hoping people will attend this event and share their views on the franchise. The MJHL regular season will begin for the Nipah Titans on Friday, September 27th with a home game against the Dauphin Kings. And Casper has gathered uh, the uh, looking back and there's so many entries from 110 years ago to 20 years ago that I'm going to read the first one from 110 years ago, 1911. Interesting. The death of S.B. McKee on Wednesday was a happy release from a long period of suffering. It is nearly two years since he learned of his affliction with cancer. But unfortunately, he entrusted his case to a Winnipeg quack and after squandering his savings, became resigned to his fate and the past year has been a, a harassing wait for the messenger. The late Mr. McCree, oh, McCree, no, McKee was a sober and industrious man, devoted to his home and respected by all who knew him. He leaves a wife, the daughter of the late M.J. Kilpatrick, and two children. Interesting wording a hundred years ago, 110 years ago. And 20 years ago, July 30th, 2001, it's a slim year for construction starts in Nipuan District. On the commercial front, the construction of a McDonald's restaurant on Highway 16 is the only new construction that has been undertaken so far this year. Meanwhile, Nipuan Area Planning District Development Officer Merv Martin said two residential houses are being built and three RTMs, ready to move homes, are being moved into Nipua. The Manitoba Education Minister Drew Caldwell, who was an NDP government at the time, said time is running out for school divisions to amalgamate voluntarily. As a result, he said school divisions will be given directions on how to redraw maps this fall. Caldwell wants new boundaries in place for the October 2002 municipal election. Trustees will also be elected at that time. And a couple of minutes. I'm not going to get to the Uh, Farmer's Advocate, the second section, a gorgeous picture, picture, outstanding in its field. There was an uninvited guest in this canola field south of Glenella. A volunteer corn stalk was seen poking up above the crop, interrupting the yellow landscape. And there's several really good articles there, but I've been given my notice how much time I have left, so... Let's get on with it. Oh, maybe I have time. The results of the Nipua Minidosa District Fat Stock Show. Um, those young people worked hard and long. I'll see if I can get through the results. Yearling heifer classes, champion Simmental yearling heifer, Nipua Vet Clinic, Brooklyn Headley, Erickson. Reserve champion Simmental yearling heifer, Eric Schultz, Nipua. Champion Angus yearling heifer, Brookmore Angus of Brookdale, Ashley Dyke, Nipua. Reserve champion Angus yearling heifer, Ackland Abbey, Rapid City. Champion shorthorn yearling heifer, Little Valley stock, livestock, Inglis family, Savannah, Bjarnason, Nipua, Reserve Champion, Shorthorn Yearling Heifer, Sierra Inglis, Rapid City. Champion Crossbreds or Other Bread Yearling Heifers, Midnight Metalworks, Madison Robertson, Nipua, uh, Reserve Crossbred, sponsored, was won by Brody Basaraba, Rapid City, Champion 4 H Progeny Yearling Heifer, McManus Simmental's was won by Carson Baker, Nipua. 
Reserve champion 4-H progeny yearling heifer, Savannah Bjarnason, Nipua Reserve best homegrown yearling heifer, Chicken Corral restaurant sponsored, Ashley Dyke, Nipua grand champion yearling heifer, Claire Larson Memorial Trophy, Ashley Dyke, Nipua reserve champion yearling heifer, Gladstone Vet Clinic, Brooklyn Headley Erickson, grand champion two-year-old heifer with calf at foot, uh, Carson Baker, Nipua, reserve champion. Two-year-old heifer with calf at foot, sponsored by Rosalind Farms. Chance Inglis, Nipua. Supreme female, J.S. Angus, Doug and Jane, Jason McLaren, sponsored. Carson Baker, Nipua, reserve supreme female. J.M.B. Charlet, Brookdale, sponsor. Winner, Ashley Dyke of Nipua. Market steer classes. In the lightest range, 1,006 to 1,174 pounds, Chance Inglis, Rapid City, and Riley Patterson Erickson. Next range, up to 1,335 pounds, Rebecca Lynn Peterson, Nipua, and Sviana Bjarnison, Nipua. And the next range, up to 1,425 pounds, Sadie Sawchuk, Nipua, and Grayson Van Meel, Rapid City. In the next weight range, up to 1,515 pounds, Avery Van Meel, Rapid City, and Brooklyn Headley of Erickson. In the next range, weight range, up to 1,725 pounds, Madison Robertson, Nipua, and Quinn Sawchuk, Nipua. And the progeny steers, uh, 820 to 1,450 pounds, Carson Baker, Nipua, and Rebecca Lynn Peterson, Nipua. The Keystone Simmental Association Awards. Highest gaining steer with Simmental influence, Brooklyn Headley from Erickson. 3.49 pounds a day. Best homegrown steer, Nipua 4 H Facts Talk Show Association, Sadie Sawchuck. Grand champion market steer, Nipua Gladstone Co op, Sadie Sawchuck and reserve champion market steer Heartland Livestock sponsored was won by Madison Robertson of Nipua. The 2021 Nipua District 4-H Fat Stock Scholarship winners are Brooklyn Headley of Erickson, Rebecca Lynn Peterson of Nipua, Angevin Langenheim, Rapid City, Mona Vanden Van Langenmeen, Rapid City, and the 50-50 ticket winner was Jeff Ross, People's Choice winner, Carrie Hinberg, Greg Washington, and Scott Bigney. A lot of stuff has happened in the last few weeks, and a lot of people have put in a lot of effort. i sure I missed something in that first section. I'll give you some headlines from the Farmers Advocate. Relief is on the way for drought-stricken farmers was announced by the Federal Minister, Ag Agricultural Minister Marie-Claude Bideau when she was speaking uh, in Manitoba. And the more than Owen Devereaux covers that fully. Kira Patterson covers the Manitoba farmers dealing with drought conditions and Manitoba beef producers. Fairly long article, very good. Uh, Kira Patterson has a photo and Casper Wareham the article on the grasshopper situation. They're more than a nuisance, they're destructive. Ammoniating foliages improves feed quality, which will be important this year. Sean Kaback from Manitoba Agriculture and Resource Development has an article on that, worthy of a read. Uh, run out of time and looking at months and years of implications, uh, that's the Manitoba beef producers, as well as a lovely photograph submitted by George Dinsdale. This bright red barn is located along Highway 250 south of Newdale, and it's beautiful. There is another letter to the editor that was submitted from uh, the same gal who, uh, Natalie Gordon from Alonza, 
why does Manitoba have vaccine? If you get a hold of a paper, page A18, a very good letter to the editor from her. Thank you for joining us again this week. So much to share. Come back again another week and pick up your own copy and read it. And we appreciate your attention for this last hour and 15 minutes. Thank you.